Welcome everyone to the June installment of the IPM Hour. Today our speaker is Navneet Kaur. Uh, Navneet is currently an assistant professor and extension entomologist at Oregon State. Uh, she did her undergraduate and master's work at uh, Punjab uh, Agricultural University in India and a PhD in entomology at the University of Florida in Gainesville, where she worked with Eileen Buss on pests of turf grass. Her background in turf grass has been really useful in Oregon, which was one of the largest producers of turf grass and clover seed in the United States with, I don't know how current these numbers are, but you can probably collect, correct me if I'm wrong about half a million acres uh, statewide producing about a thousand different varieties. Um, in addition to her research responsibilities, she's also the editor of the Pacific Northwest Insect Management Handbook. And I know those things are a lot of work and very time consuming. And today, Navneet is going to talk to us about the use of enemapathogenic nematodes for insect control in Oregon seed crops. Thanks, Ned, for the introduction, and thanks for hosting uh, the talk today. Uh, I'm very thankful to the Western IPM Center to represent it in, uh, this work and uh, funding the initial, the project initiation study uh, to look at some of these nematodes to address some critical insect pest issues in seed crops in Oregon. So um, let's get started. My name is Navneet Kaur, and I am extension entomologist and assistant professor at Oregon State University. And um, let me see if I can advance the slide. Okay, so, um, so I'm based on campus uh, in Western Oregon in Corvallis, uh, and my academic home department is crop and soil science uh, with College of Agriculture at Oregon State. I'm leading uh, the field crop entomology program to oversee the arthropod pest management in diverse seed cropping systems and other specialty cropping systems in Oregon. So I have a huge extension uh, component to this position uh, by um, doing applied research uh, in statewide, with statewide responsibilities uh, and applied research in seed cropping system and other specialty crops, and also uh, communicating these research findings uh, to our different industries uh, via different channels. So this is the blog web page of Field Crop Entomology Program, where we post our latest research updates, our publications that are open access, and also the best alerts and match to uh, keep our industries informed. So the program focus in Field Crop Entomology uh, Program is uh, to develop and implement uh, the IPM strategies for sustainable arthropod pest management uh, in diverse Oregon cropping systems. I'm glad Matt mentioned about the diverse Oregon cropping systems or the Oregon seed production crops. Uh, the pictures here on the bottom of the slide are different, uh, crop, uh, different seed crops. Uh, I'm very proud that I got to work on uh, this diverse and unique cropping system. Uh, Oregon is world's largest producer of cool season grass seed crops. Um, so uh, the, the, the cool, wet um, summer or spring uh, or winter, uh, cool, wet winter and spring timing in Oregon and dry summer favor the seed production system. And that's why we have this high a uh, high acreage of cool season turf, uh, cool season grass species that are grown for uh, grown for seed production that is used in either turf lawns or or forage and such. So uh, the uh, Corvallis, or, uh, Oregon State University's campus is based uh, in Western Oregon, Benton County. And um, we are very close to Lynn County, which has a signboard as you enter uh, Corvallis, like welcome to Lynn County, the grass seed capital of the world. So um, we are very proud of this cropping system and uh, others. So uh, clovers, uh, for instance, they are uh, radiation crops to most of our grass system. We grow uh, different species of clover, uh, red clover, white clover, the pictures here, and then other like crimson clover and such are other rotational crops to grass seed systems. So my program offers uh, different IPM approaches to address uh, insect pest 
problems in, in each of these systems. So, uh, as I, as I said, we are committed to deliver the latest research-based information to our industries, and we do so by uh, publishing our uh, research in extension articles, um, and uh, obviously the PNW Insect Handbook, uh, which has results of our efficacy trials, uh, new, new insecticide chemistries as they become available uh, for crops, like lab label listing and delisting of uh, different chemistries. Uh, besides that, uh, the IPM research that I'm focused uh, is on exploring the biocontrol potential uh, in these cropping systems for insect pest management. So one publication uh, that just got released uh, last year was Grass Seed uh, Pest and Beneficials. Uh, it's a pocket guide, as you can see in the picture on the, on the right here. Uh, and I can just go to the next slide here. Uh, so this publication is, uh, as the name suggests, Pocket Guide to Grass Seed Pest and Beneficials. It's an identification, insect monitoring, and management guide. Uh, this publication includes information on the diversity of insect pests that occur in grass seed systems uh, in different grass uh, seed species, like like tall fescue, uh, orchard grass, et cetera, and all these uh, different slew of insect pests that uh, affect these cropping systems. So this publication mainly talks about the identification characteristics, how to tell apart your pest species from beneficials, uh, where you can find your insect pest, sampling techniques, and several arbitrary or set thresholds uh, for, uh, for management strategies. It also includes uh, information on PAMS uh, uh, prevention, monitoring, and suppression approaches uh, uh, along the lines of IPM. Uh, we, uh, along with USU Extension Service and along uh, uh, and with the support of Oregon uh, Seed Council and several grass seed commissions were able to publish uh, this, uh, this uh, pocket guide and uh, it was actually printed on rain fast paper and distributed to over a thousand of grass seed growers uh, statewide. So it's a huge success to deliver this, uh, uh, this uh, guide in a physical, in a printed copy as well as online version, which is an app version of this uh, guide. So this publication has is being very well received and it's almost in all uh, like young field men, crop consultants and growers uh, truck. So this is a wonderful tool, IPM tool, I would say. So beside this publication, as Matt said, uh, I am the editor for PNW Insect Handbook. Uh, it has been two years. I am overseeing uh, the the editing for this uh, IPM guide. Uh, I am thankful to my wonderful section editors. I have about 10 section editors for this handbook. Uh, we collaborate uh, like whole PNW region with University of Idaho, WSU and Oregon State. We collaborate with our contributors across three regions for uh, different uh, insect pest of different commodities, which include agri diverse agricultural commodities, horticultural commodities, and along with some insect pest problems of uh, that are uh, that occur in home ho homes or master gardener uh, gardener uh, like um, situations. So uh, this uh, guide is mostly about uh, listing and delisting about uh, insect pest uh, the insecticides and also includes information on any invasive species as they occur uh, periodically. So this publication is uh, edited each year and revised uh, annually and reissued annually. So it's a big task uh, that keeps us busy. So uh, now moving on to the IPM situation. Uh, when I came um, at OSU in 2019, um, I was uh, fortunate enough to start my position six months prior to the pandemic. And during pandemic, um, you know, we all know uh, there was not much going on. 
in field research or there were some restrictions uh, to do any lab research. But anyways, uh, coming back to that point, uh, when I, I had some time to assess what was the situation of IPM, where we stand and what are the barriers. So if we go uh, flashback 20 year, 21 years ago, this is a special uh, like a publication that was, uh, it's a publication, like screenshot of publication that was uh, published in OSU's Extension Service Special Report. This title is IPM in Oregon, Achievements and Future Directions. Um, it was written by my predecessor, Dr. Glenn Fisher, uh, who was extension entomologist back then. And he highlighted how insect identification plays an important role in IPM implementation. So all those uh, facts or uh, principles of IPM were highlighted and there were some barriers that were also highlighted, highlighted that uh, play important role in the delay between the development and adoption of IPM practices. Back then, uh, it was um, it was emphasized that there was not much uh, there were not much extension uh, or entomology trained uh, personnel in extension roles. But this is not the case uh, anymore uh, after two decades. So we are we are for, uh, fortunate that we are making progress in that uh, area. We have more county extension agents who are working on their IPM systems uh, lately. So this is great news that uh, we are able to identify our barriers and overcome them to help um, the implementation of IPM. Also, another publication that I referred for my needs assessment um, when I was starting my program here at OSU was this uh, one publication that was published in Journal of Extension. Um, the title is IPM Summit Reveals Barriers, Needs, and goals for agriculture extension. So this publication was based on the data collected during a IPM summit that was held in 2019. The summit was led by statewide IPM coordinator, Katie Murray, and she has several uh, guests and uh, uh, which included mainly faculty members uh, across different departments, different programs. Uh, representing different best uh, groups uh, like weed science, weed science and pathology and insect uh, or entomologists and they reported uh, the top barriers, needs and goals for IPM directions. So this paper is really, uh, you know, this is helpful to know where should we start or what the knowledge gaps are or what the barriers are. So I have referred this paper as I was developing my needs assessment. So the top barriers in IPM implementation in Oregon, the first cropping system, that's were very common across commodities where more research is needed for decision support systems and real-time uh, tools. I am pretty sure there are much progress since this paper was published or since the work was in progress since then. But uh, you know, um, it's always appreciated when growers can access our data in real time and, and make decisions for insect pest management using these IPM tools. The, another, uh, the other barrier was low level of confidence uh, or risk factor that is involved trying out new things as alternatives to pesticides. So uh, that is that will always be the case, but I think with more research enforced um, uh, recommendations, uh, we can overcome that barrier. Uh, the third barrier that was uh, that is still present is limited access or understanding how biological based products or or biological based pest management tools work. Uh, so a lot of room for research in this area for different insect pest system and different cropping systems. And then uh, the last but not the least is lack of action thresholds. A lot of our action th thresholds are arbitrary. So there is a lot of research need to be done in this area to refine those thresholds to, so that we can reduce the inputs, uh, chemical inputs in our systems. So, uh, so that was helpful for me where I should be focusing my research uh, program so that we can address these critical issues. So now coming back to the grass seed production systems and insect pest management in Oregon, um, grass seed cropping system is unique. 
um, it's a learning curve for anybody who is starting how to produce grass seed and how to address the pest management issues. Grass seed crops are perennial crops. One tall fescue stand can stay in the ground for eight long years. So we have a lot of uh, species of grass seed that are perennial in nature, which means they have insect issues or other uh, is our other uh, agronomy issues that may um, worse as the crop stand ages. So the pictures on the left uh, indicate, uh, the first picture indicates the field burning that is going on. Um, we used to have a field uh, burning for straw management in these grass seed systems after harvest, but uh, feed bur field burning is no longer allowed uh, since last decade or so or more than that. Uh, so reduction in field burning or complete stop it, stopping of field burning has resulted in has resulted in associated problems with insect weeds, etc. Same thing with tillage. We know some of our soil borne pest problems. Um, they are um, you know they they kept they are kept at bay with tillage, but some of our um, growers um, are no-till or uh, low-till or no-till operations. So in those cases, we know uh, problems like uh, uh, soil-borne arthropods uh, can become an issue. So uh, insect pest management in grass seed is a challenge. And uh, in uh, collectively insect pest pressure, being aphids, being lepidopteran insect pests of several kinds like cutworms, armyworms, et cetera, uh, and other uh, insect species can cause up to 30 to 40% damage in one year. And uh, lack of adequate control measures um, or insect pest predisposing factors like drought years. Like uh, one example would be um, last year was a drought year for us, and we had high, high damage of billbugs in these grass seed systems. And some growers did lose their field or entire field to this billbug bill bug damage. So in those cases, the insect pest are 100% yield loss factors. So uh, regarding control measures, um, we are heavy, heavy relying on insecticide applications. Uh, available insecticide uh, products that are currently registered for grass seed are inadequate. They are mostly represented by fewer insecticide groups, which are pyrethroids, um, group 3A, organophosphates, or broad spectrum chemistries in 1B, and some newer uh, compounds are available now, anthralic diamides, group, group 28. So we are making some progress, but we are still behind on these specialty seed production systems. So limited options and heavy reliance on pyrethroids, uh, we are signing up for newer problems like pesticide resistance and uh, non-target effects on beneficials. So this is the situation current, and there is more room for uh, testing out newer chemistries, trying out alternatives, IPM approaches. So uh, our problems become uh, more complicated with uh, current chloropyrifos regulation uh, status, which is already in place at the state level. Uh, majority of rulemaking has already happened. Uh, these are some pictures of permanent chloropyrifos rule that took place in December of 2020. Uh, and we will not be able to use any chloropyrifos act uh, active ingredient uh, in our insecticide be, uh, beyond December 31st, 2023 deadline. Uh, on federal level, uh, EPA has already uh, revoked the food uh, feed tolerances um, of chloropyrifos use, and some non-feed, uh, non-food and feed uh, uses are uh, remaining still, and then their interim decision is still pending. Uh, we don't know uh, what will be our what deadline we'll have to follow. Uh, so we are just waiting uh, for that decision. So, um, so there is a high priority that is identified by our growers, industry groups for looking for alternatives to chloropyrifos. So as a result of those um, 
needs assessment and uh, the high research priority, we have formed a October Pitifoss alternative work group at Oregon State University. This is spearheaded by Dr. Sylvia Rondon, who is also the new director of Oregon IPM Center. And this is a, this is a collaborative effort between a different faculties who are strategically located in different, uh, different parts of Oregon and working on different commodities. Uh, so this project was funded by a specialty crop block program by ODA. So the responsibilities of this work group is uh, to, to work collaboratively on identifying the critical use patterns of fluoropyrifos to identifying what uh, industries are being affected and then communi communicating on different alternative approaches, obviously selecting uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and soliciting a new insecticide chemistries as they become available and testing and generating all that data to support and also communicating these research findings to end users. Um, so uh, this has been a, gr a really great partnership uh, to learn about different alternative research approaches uh, that, may, uh, that may be successful for alternatives to chlorophyllophos. So as a part of this research work group, um, and I'm pretty sure, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure um, we are all aware of the uh, chlorophyllophos critical use surveys um, that were conducted by OSU. Um, and uh, these surveys were supported by the efforts of ODA as well as Western IPM Center. So um, the, these corporate false critical use surveys were conducted parts of 2021 to identify what industries were being impacted. And these included two surveys um, um, that were funded uh, by ODA, uh, Oregon Specialty Crop Plan Program and Western IPM Center had included different sets of questions. Uh, the format was Qualtrics and the target audience or tar target respondents were uh, growers, con crop consultants, researchers, extension agents, and such. And these surveys were distributed at different growers meetings, um, OSU listservs, commodity commissions, listservs, and newsletters, and also direct emails to the clientele. They were well received. Uh, a huge response was collected in both these surveys, and there were up to thirty commodities uh, that were uh, that were identified to be affected, or at least thirty commodities were represented in these surveys. This data has been published uh, by, in one of the research report, and my colleague Danny Lytle is also working on compiling all these results so that. Uh, so that it's, it's publicly available. So now uh, coming back to the survey results highlight, um, 35 commodity groups were uh, impacted and grass seed, uh, um, mint, uh, peppermint, and specialty crops uh, like vegetable seed crops and several small fruit crops were were reported to be impacted by the chlorophyllophos loss. And the survey results that consistently identified, the best problems that were consistently uh, identified included sod webworm, uh, one of the species, uh, Christuchia topiara, one of the crambid moth species in grass seed crops, and then followed by symphylans that were reported in several commodities like grass seed, peppermint, vegetable seeds, uh, and other specialty cropping system. Symphylans are being a major pest in Western Oregon uh, because of our soils, good soil structure, and wet conditions do favor this pest. Other pest species that were identified in the survey were aphids and root maggots, uh, onion maggot and cabbage maggots uh, were the other pests. So sod webworm, um, it, it occurred consistently and it was identified as the biggest concern to the grass seed production systems. So uh, we knew that this is a high priority area and 
And uh, so this become a, a, high, a high priority area for our program as well to address this need. Um, so our bedworm, um, this species um, also known as cranberry girdler. These pictures show uh, the different life stages of insect. The picture above here shows a larvae that feed on the crown or root region of grass, grass seed crops. Uh, this pest also occurs in home lawns, golf courses, and other turf production or turf systems, as well as uh, is reported to occur in cranberries, as the common name suggests, the cranberry girdler. So in grass seed system, this insect pest um, causes damage by consistently feeding on the roots and crown region that results in the poor fall regrowth in perennial systems. Uh, reducing the seed yield and also increased input to control this pest. And in some cases, uh, 150, uh, 1,500 pounds of seed loss per acre has been uh, reported for this, for this single species. The lower picture is uh, the adult uh, moths. The moths start flying sometime in summer, uh, and then they consistently lay eggs. The larvae feed during the summer um, through late summer late summer through fall, causing the damage in the crown regions or the root system of the, of the grass. So um, to address uh, this insect pest, uh, the typical approach is chemical insecticides, but insecticides are not always promising or is not always a, a promising approach because of there is asynchrony in the susceptible life stage and optimum application window. As I said, the moths of this insect, they fly during summer, they lay eggs during the summer, late summer part, and this insect pest is actively feeding in the early, late fall, uh, late, late summer or early, I'm sorry. So late fall uh, or early fall uh, time of the year. Uh, so our summers are typically dry. Uh, our late summer is typically dry and we have to rely on first fall application, uh, first of all, rainfall for the successful application of insecticides. So there is a mismatch in the timing of the application and the, and the, and the susceptible uh, timing of the, of the life stage. So uh, the chemical control needs uh, at least irrigation or rain uh, to be effective. And then the other problem uh, in the chemical control is that there is at least more than one inch of straw load that sits on the ground after field burning is performed or uh, harvest is performed that uh, results in the poor chemical control. Therefore, alternative methods of uh, pest management are needed. So here comes our research. Uh, oh, there's another picture that I wanted to show. There's another uh, research uh, picture from our insecticide efficacy trial. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of field burning residue still in the trial. So those are the some of the chemical uh, some of the challenges in chemical control of sod bedworm. So, so that's why we would look, we would want to look at the alternative research tactics and use of biocontrol methods such as EPNs and thermopathogenic nematodes could serve as a promising alternative. So um, this research uh, was funded initially funded by Oregon Seed Council to do some pilot study and then was uh, funded by Western IPM Center as well in 2020, 2021 uh, for this project initiation uh, uh, project. So uh, sod webworm, they are soil dwelling insect species. The larvae of this insect stays in the, in the, in the soil and is constantly exposed to the pathogenic organisms. So identifying these organisms and determining their, what species they are, determining their seasonal fluctuation and population dynamics, and also testing their virulence against these pest species would help us develop a promising biological control agent for the IPM implementation. So these were some of our uh, hypotheses to uh, undertake this research. So another thing is uh, my program is, do is doing a lot of insecticide screening for uh, different selective chemistries, but we know EPNs don't need uh, uh, 
uh, they are exempt from EPA registration. So they'll be fast for fast form of alternatives that can become available to us. So that's why it was very important for us to look for what local or native EPN strains already exist in our commercial systems that are well adapted to environmental conditions and are specific to some of our uh, best species. Um, we knew uh, another point was we knew that mass production is possible uh, in the lab and commercially, and then they can be utilized under uh, for a variety of our soil dwelling insect pests and above ground pests. So these were some of the uh, background reasons we were interested to conduct this research. Uh, literature also provided promising evidence as there were several reports that existed from Canada or Wisconsin that the cranberry girdler, uh, um, the, the same species uh, in cranberry system is uh, susceptible to several strains of entomopathogenic commercial formulations. Uh, this paper, uh, uh, Incidence of Oscheus on Reiki, is another uh, paper on Rebutita species that uh, that was found in a survey that, that was conducted in marshlands of Wisconsin, and they identified these native strains that were affecting some of these um, subterranean pest species in Wisconsin in cranberry marshland. So this was promising and was very motivating to uh, motivating for us to conduct this research in grass seed systems to know what native species occur in Oregon commercial systems. Uh, and then uh, the native species that were identified during uh, Wisconsin, they were also tested in the semi-field or field conditions and they, they tended to be uh, uh, promising. So with all this background, we, uh, we, we started our field survey of identification of local EPNs. Um, uh, as a part of this project initiation study, we conducted soil survey uh, in 22 commercial fields in the spring of uh, 2021. And these species included tall fescue, fine fescue, rye grass, orchard grass in Western Oregon. And they were, uh, they were all these sites that had this known history of sod webworm uh, infestation. So we took, uh, grids, we took grid sampling from five random points uh, in the field and we made a composite sample in, in, to, bring, to bring in the lab. So these samples were processed uh, according to the published literature doing the baiting isolation techniques uh, using the wax worms. These are some of the pictures of baiting. Uh, we used five um, wax worm larvae to bait out these nematodes. Uh, some of the picture, pictures here of infected wax worms uh, with this discoloration of um, discoloration when they were infected. We use white trap uh, method to isolate these uh, APNs. And then once uh, uh, these uh, infective juveniles, IJs, emerge out of those, uh, we maintain these cultures uh, in vivo in the lab. Uh, for infectivity and for identification uh, assays. So for identification, we had to rely on molecular methods only. We ran um, a universal CO1 primer for nematodes. These are all published literature, how we isolated them, identified them, um, sequenced uh, the DNA, uh, uh, and then uh, how we constructed the phylogenetic tree using different models in a genius software. So very basic stuff. Uh, and then uh, here are some of the summaries of uh, summary of findings. So out of our 88 composite samples uh, representing up to 450 or 440 single point samples during four sampling dates uh, during spring, we recovered uh, 25 percent samples uh, that had uh, these uh, infective juveniles that we could rear out. Um, so, and uh, these, and then based on mass culturing and identification in the, uh, using the DNA-based methods, three isolates were identified uh, that were entomopathogenic nematodes and rest of the isolates that we found were only free living because we could not reculture them in the lab. So again, the summary table here of three native isolates that were identified in this study. 
and we call them Oregon, Willamette Valley 1, 2, and 3 isolate. The first isolate had high identificate, highly identical to Strenernema CO1 gene, and the, the GenBank accession numbers are listed here, and their identity to each uh, strain, corresponding um, strain is uh, represented in this table. So Strenernema, Oschistipuli strain, and then one unidentified nematode isolate uh, strain were the prominent or the, uh, the strains that were identified in this study. So this was mostly a discovery phase of this research project, and uh, and now um, and now we are maintaining these cultures and um, in the lab to for ongoing infectivity trials. So this slide here uh, represents the phylogenetic relationship of these uh, three different strains to uh, known known uh, endemopathogenic strains. Um, in this um, table, uh, or in this uh, phylogeny, phylogeny uh, tree here, you can see Phasmodapodita, which is one of the slug parasitic nematode, is out, used as up, outgroup, and then are three different strains that were identified and their relationship, relationships to the known EPN species. Um, so these results um, were, uh, you know, were uh, promising, indicating that uh, the natural, the, there's a na native species that already exists. So, and we just have to use, uh, establish the use patterns of these nematodes in future. So these findings were disseminated at um, at the ESA annual meetings by by our students, uh, also at the growers, the different growers meetings uh, to. Um, to highlight the role of nematodes and one fact sheet was released uh, by OSU Extension Service uh, to, to highlight what are these EPNs, how they, how they work um, and why are they being studied, what we found and where we can go next. So we, we did conduct like pre and post surveys of this, uh, of this project and uh, there were a lot of knowledge gaps that were identified during the pre phase, and then we made some progress for by addressing some of those uh, basic biological control questions in the post survey. So this there was improvement uh, uh, in in the not there was knowledge gain of these growers um, who worked closely with us during this survey or during this project. So the next step in this project are that we have maintained the colonies of all these isolates uh, for our ongoing infectivity tests. We have been testing these uh, strains against black cutworm right now. We are trying to rear sort webworm colony, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is challenging to rear in the lab. So, so th those are some, some of the things that are still ongoing. We have partnered with other uh, other labs, other microbial control labs, uh, and obtained their EPN strain collections to compare virulence of our EPN isolates against uh, those commercial um, strains. So preliminary data that was done with black cutworm uh, and infectivity uh, assays was promising. The insects uh, were dying within 48 hours of exposure to these uh, native strains. And we have requested some funding uh, to conduct in-depth studies to establish future use pattern by doing some musicosum study in the greenhouse or semi-field conditions. One question that was uh, that that was um, our grow like our growers asked one question: How these nematodes will be compatible with? any of the pesticide or insecticide formulations that they, they have been using in the field. So we'll be performing some petri dish and uh, misocosm study to see how compatible our, our EPN strains are to, our, uh, to our, some of our selective chemistries or other broad spectrum chemistries that are being used in the field. So with this, um, this was a team effort uh, at Oregon State, and I'm, with, I'm very thankful to my team members, uh, my uh, field crop entomology crew, uh, these students who do 
work each day, every day in the field, in the lab, and they're very self-motivated. Many field men, crop consultant, and growers uh, who participated in this research, and my collaborators, Dr. Nicole Anderson, uh, Dr. Betsy Verhoeven, Dr. Dr. Christy Tanner, and Dr. Seth Dorman. So, so thank you so much for listening, and I'm also thankful to my funding agencies to support this preliminary work. So I think we have enough time for questions. Thanks, Navneet. That was terrific. Um, so for everyone uh, in the audience, you can either take your microphone off mute and ask your question that way, or you can drop your question into the chat. Uh, I am monitoring the chat. Um, so we do have a question in the chat, <clears throat> uh, and it's regarding the sort of the uh, the weather conditions in Western uh, Oregon and whether or not those would be conducive to nematode survivorship and infection. Um, and then the second part of the question is about species specificity of the nematodes. How specific are these nematodes for particular hosts? Sure, this is a very good question. Uh, so for Western Oregon, the EPNs, um, we are this, this, the weather conditions are really conducive because we are wet throughout the year, except for our summer months. We typically don't get any rain between 4th of July weekend to third week of September. So those are our only dry time of the year in Western Oregon. So, but for our soil dwelling insects, for example, if something is feeding throughout the fall, that's our wettest time of the year or winter. So nematodes can keep those soil dwelling uh, larvae or pupae at the bay um, by acting. So yes, our con conditions are conducive. And about species specificity, uh, the three isolates that we found, uh, Stenernema, uh, species we could not find like how specific I mean it's still ongoing that's why we are testing in our infectivity tests we are testing including our lepidopteron like black cutworm and our goal is to also to rear out some sort of worm and then try those in, in in our infectivity trials so we don't know about the species specificity yet but they're very insect specific at least that we know of um, the Osteus stipuli, it, it is one of those uh, crane fly uh, parasitic nematode. So we, we still have to figure out, uh, Sylvia, what we got. And uh, so it's very, very discovery. Uh, it's still at, on the discovery phase. And as I said, we are maintaining these cultures and a lot to follow. Yeah, great. Um, all right. Oh, here we go. Let's see. Um, with high input costs and uh, chlorpyrifos restrictions, are growers reducing the number of sprays and changing their selection of uh, insecticides? And are any of these crops more sensitive to price increases for insecticides? So we have two groups of uh, growers uh, who are taking that, or two group of practitioners. Uh, we have one group of practitioner who is, uh, still relying on erythroids or broad spectrum chemistries. So we, the, the goal of our program is to advocate, you know, non-use or to advocate the use of selective chemistries. Right. So, so we have that group where a large number of acreage, they are spraying these erythroids and we know we, our job is to tell them that they are signing up for bigger problems by doing so. And then we have, we do have some progressive group of growers who are very, very accepting uh, that they have to go for selective chemistries, a selective insecticide for a selective insects. So we have made some progress for aphid, uh, aphid targeted compounds. So they know that what they should be targeting uh, and with what. So, so yes, uh, with high input cost restrictions. So yeah, so it is changing um, and then more sensitive to, so it all depends on the on the crop, like about the price. I think on high value, like peppermint, we do have uh, we do have some selective um, group of insecticide that that our growers use. So it all depends on the cost of your commodity as well. Right. I guess with the price point for um, grass seed, where presumably your sod webworm is your biggest problem, um, would the price point be high enough for that particular crop? 
to justify the higher cost associated with something like an animal pathogenic nematode application. So recently our seed crop prices have gone up. So I'm pretty sure that will favor uh, the use of selective chemistries in, in those cases as well. I see, okay. All right, um, I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat. So again, if anybody would like to ask a question, by all means, uh, you can either type it into the chat or you can take your uh, mic off mute. <clears throat> I have an additional you... question since there isn't any. Navneet, this is amazing. I'm just, how are you able to do the writing and this sort of exploratory research and real direct insecticide work is astounding. And I wanted to ask you about the nematode work. Can you scale it up in the lab? Is it possible to produce enough material to do like plot trials or does that require a commercial partner? So right now we do have some in vivo cultures that are we're growing, but yeah, I, by all means, I will need a partner uh, if we have to do a commercial uh, commercial scale work or commercial scale trial. Yes. Uh, was that your question, Andoni? It was, yeah. So we have um, uh, a hand up. Clayton Meyer. Clayton, do you want to go ahead and take your your mic off mute and you can ask your question? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Hi, Navneet. Um, you were talking a little bit about straw management and the fact that straw is often left behind in the field. Is that true for all grass uh, production systems? And is anyone looking into alternatives to that? Like, would it make sense to maybe bale and remove the straw to allow for better pesticide penetration at different application timings? And just curious how important it is to leave the straw in the field and what might be altered there. So, okay. So the alternative straw management, like baling and flailing, they have made a lot of progress since last past two decades. But I when I was coming through from like a point like how the field burning has impacted some of our soil born. So it has like all the, so within seed production systems, there has been a lot of agronomic improvement, how we can manage our straw recently. Or better penetration. The next, uh, so that the part of the question was better penetration. Um, so, for example, some of our insecticides they are very rain fast or have less solubility. So that's why they needed this uh, at least one to two inches of uh, or or high intensity of rainfall so that they can be able to reach their target. Makes sense. So we will, yeah, we will definitely need some more higher solubility of insecticide compounds uh, to be able to reach. So that would be one of the improvement factor. Okay. Um, I have a follow up if there's time, but I'll defer to someone else if someone else has a question. Go ahead, Clayton. Uh, just curious how how much uh, seed production is done under chemigation, or is that not really <laughs> a thing in your part of Oregon? And if any sorts of, uh, you know, I, I don't know if much grass is grown under center pivots or what your system is, but like if, if that could be another potential approach for some producers. It is very, so the Oregon grass seed productions are very diverse. So, so I, so sod webworm remains a problem in the, in the rain fed agriculture. Uh, however, in the dry land or irrigated, um, then you have irrigate, irrigation system. They, they, those guys may not have those problems that I was talking about. But we have very limited acres, at least in Western Oregon, that are irrigated. So most of the agriculture is rain fed. Thank you. OK. Uh, the next question is, can nematodes penetrate the pre-pupil cocoons that are formed in the fall? So Len, when we were doing infectivity trials, we did saw some activities of our deformed pupil, like if we have used the later instar larvae. Um, but for sod bedworm, um, I'm not sure. Uh, so mostly the, I mean, it was effective against the large or the later instar, instar so I would say there is, there is some, some activity going. Yeah, makes sense. Um, your next question, what are the remaining steps to commercialization of your nematodes? 
So at this point, uh, we are not at the commercialization step yet. So it was mostly dis discovery. We found that there, there, that there are strains out there in commercial, commercial fields. So now we have to uh, generate this infectivity data and see how specific our strains were and how, uh, what was their infection rate uh, and then how compatible they are with our insecticide uh, commonly used insecticide or pesticide products to establish any use patterns and then also to test how persistent they are when they're applied. So all these, all these things need to be tested first before we can start talking about the commercialization. Okay. Great question though. So I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat. Again, if somebody has a question, by all means, take yourself, take your uh, mic off mute. Um, but if there are no additional questions, I will ask my question. Sure. Um, so there are commercially available enema pathogenic nematode, nematode Steiner nema carpa capsi, of course, is probably the best known, um, but there, there are others. And I'm curious how, um, it didn't look like you had done this, but um, maybe you're planning to do this, how the efficacy of your uh, native uh, strains <clears throat> compares to um, something like a commercialized Steiner Nema Carpa Capsi, which you can buy, you know, in bulk, how, how that efficacy sort of compares. So we did some preliminary infectivity tests, like a petri dish test uh, in the lab, and they were all compatible to those commercial strains. And uh, for commercial strains, we have partnered with one of the microbiology control lab at USTA, where we are obtaining these commercial strains for say, uh, we exactly know the concentration for those strains. So we'll be able to make more, uh, uh, more progress in that direction where we have now better commercial strains in the lab to test against these native strains and then making conclusions how effective or how compatible the virulence was for the yeah. all different EPNs. Yeah, and and then I have a follow up, um, and this has to do with sort of the way you're thinking about controlling your particular problem. Um, usually, the way we think of using enema pathogenic nematodes is as a an inundative sort of uh, application of nematodes, large number of nematodes, and we don't really anticipate that they'll persist for very long. Um, with your sort of work looking at uh, native strains, it sounds like you're thinking more in terms of sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of conservation biological control where you're thinking that what you would do is basically change the condition so that you could promote the nematodes and their control of your target pest. It, would that be a fair assessment or, or are you thinking about more like an inundative biocontrol effort? So, for alternative perspective, if there are progressive growers who would like to include these nematodes with, that are commercially available, uh, that will be number one thing to go uh, because you know they can use these commercial nematodes on their commercial farms. So that will be a good, uh, good thing. Uh, and then with all this data with the native strains, uh, um, our goal is to first generate our data and then see how persistent these are. The, the thing with these strains is like osteus, for example, we do have some crane fly problems here. So to know what species, what strain was specific to what best would be another good thing. Uh, so it all depends on the data in coming years um, as we go along uh, the project. So, so yes, uh, first of all, conservation to know like what our broad spectrum insecticides or selective insecticides are doing uh, to these. Uh, so both, so conservation and in native, yes. Okay, all right. Steve, do you have a question? I do not have a question. You do not have a question, okay. Uh, I am not seeing any additional questions. Um, so actually, I do have a question. I thought okay. of it earlier and I had forgotten it until now. Um, Navni, this was all, I mean, this was insect focus. What, what sort of the, the comparative disease pressure, insect pressure for, for growers in terms of their overall pest management or overall 
in the, seed, in the seed production system. In seed production systems, yeah. So, as I said, there is a diversity of insect pest problems from lepidopteran, coleopteran, bell bugs, wireworms, um, um, and aphid species. So regarding disease, disease pressure that these insects can vector, I can think about the Warley yellow dwarf complex um, that are aphid vectored. Uh, so that is another one yield limiting factor. Uh, beside that, uh, in Western Oregon, we do have uh, this uh, rust incidence. Mm -hmm. And I think you already know in grass seed system, ergot disease is another pest problem, uh, mostly in Eastern side. I have worked on ergot disease in the past roles. So those are some of our disease issues. And then there's whole slew of weed issues and grass. Growth yeah. and weed, so. yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, Clayton has another question. Clayton, go ahead. I'll sneak one more in before the end here. Um, you mentioned broad spectrum insecticides generally, and that you're talking mostly about diamides, OPs, and pyrethroids. In terms of other OPs, you know, we're always looking at the regulatory horizon. I'm curious if you have other major OP needs that are hanging out there. I think of like NALID or uh, triclorphan uh, and some of those other, uh, is there just anything that we should keep on our radar for the seed crops? I don't know. I don't, I don't think my growers would like to hear that <laughs> so so we do Lars Band was one of our first choice for all these growers uh, we do have a registration for melatheon and some of the granular insecticide compounds that are targeted for uh, wire worms and such so all righty okay uh, well, thanks again, Avneep. That was terrific. Um, let's see, I just want to remind everyone that our next installment for, of the IPM Hour will be July 13th, and that'll be uh, Jacqueline Surratt talking about uh, Areophyid Mite Integrated Pest Management. Um, and uh, is there anything else, Steve, that I, that I didn't mention? Nope. Oh, and thank you for pronouncing that, because I wouldn't have gotten it right. <laughs> Thanks again, Navneet. All right, thank you so much, everybody, for your participation in the bu busy field season. And thank you, Matt and Steve, for hosting.